You are most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, our moderator this morning. Uh, you will forgive me at times uh, this technology becomes a problem. I want to thank you for inviting me to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, be able to share a few things about entrepreneurship. I have been closely following uh, Bishop Stewart University and I must say I'm proud of the achievements that you've made, me as an academician, as a Ugandan, that as universities grow and change, we should be able to welcome them and support them. Uh, we haven't been able to establish relations yet, but uh, I'm sure MOOBS has capacity, for instance, to give you one PhD program per year for some time to develop people in business education, because wow. we develop that capacity. So, uh, Thank you for inviting me. I like, I've been uh, listening in on the strategic plan. This is the way to go. The strategic plan enables you to ha have control over what is taking place. But most important, understand the environment. If you don't understand the environment that you are operating in, very, very difficult for you to actually operate. And with the COVID, uh, I hope that uh, you are making changes in your plan because COVID has changed everything. Mm -hmm. uh, what you had thought about a year back is different. It's gone. It's finished. Uh, we had wonderful plans, but we are now back on the table wondering what to do in light of the impact of COVID. We have only final year students in, in the school. How do we manage the others? And those universities that uh, generate their own funds like we do, have a big problem because uh, we had not finished semester two, so had not paid all the money. Now we are trying to finish semester two. We don't have all the students and that you have to keep on uh, with the resources. So um, my topic this morning is, is entrepreneurship a true driver to institutions of higher education in achieving their mission and vision. And I've been listening very intently on the mission and vision of the university. You got it right mission should be able to show the benefits the benef the, of to the public. What is it? And the vision should be able to see, for you to see where you are going. Uh, as the, the chancellor said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So in my presentation, I want to uh, Sorry, I, let me put the entire slide show so that I can, I'm able to, to just click. Uh, just going back a little bit. This is my presentation format. I want to talk about universities and the roles. Of course, I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but I want to bring up the issue of funding of universities because it impacts on the issue of entrepreneurship very much. Uh, then we'll look at what is entrepreneurship. And uh, I want to dwell on um, an entrepreneurial university, uh, what challenges it has, what it constitutes, and what is not an entrepreneurial university and possibly the way ahead, where do we want to go from? So we, we are looking at um, uh, what, is, what is a university. Uh, we all know what it is. I don't want to go into that. And I'm using the word university rather than Institute of Higher Education deliberately because that's where I've been. And I know I've been working with um, uh, technical and vocational institutions. Their issues are completely different from those of main, main, mainstream universities. Uh, they need a lot of government support, a lot of equipment. So really, uh, it would not, it not be appropriate for me to use this uh, to, to refer to uh, technical and vocational uh, institutes, institutes of high learning. So the roles of the universities are known. There are mainly three, research, teaching, and service to the community. But all this is determined by the funding and the infrastructure and the, and the staffing. And when you look at the staffing, you are looking at... Um, uh, a chicken and egg. Uh, 
to be able to, to get good researchers, we must have good staff. Be able to get good staff, we must have good researchers. Be able to teach well, you must have good, good, good researchers. Be able to, 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 to research, you must have good teachers. It's all connected. And once you get it right, then you are able to move the institution in that direction which you, you want it to go as an entire institution. So let's look at the funding of universities. I'm, I'm talking about this because it's very important uh, that uh, a country, if you look at Europe, Europe is mainly funded by government, whereas Britain and North America are funded by private sector and, uh, and businesses. So it's important for us to be able to understand the funding of universities. I've, I've been looking at various universities that we have. For instance, when COVID was announced, private universities had to close. They even laid off staff. While government universities, we've not been teaching, but we've been having a salary. That makes a lot of difference in the lives of the university. So the, in, the, the, the method of funding impacts on the role and the activities of the university. Uh, we must appreciate government recently, they gave uh, 30 billion shillings to Makere for research, but uh, we are all saying, okay, why Makere? Why not Bishop Stewart? I think government must go out and provide funds to all public universities to enable them perform their rightful role. So Bishop Stewart, you need also to, you know, through the Vice Chancellor's Forum, put some pressure on this so that we can get uh, some research funding, for, maybe for all universities. You know, let every professor, let every university lecturer apply for this money somewhere so that they can use it. So what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is searching and exploiting opportunities. It is uh, generating ideas, especially on a continuous basis. That's what we call creativity. It is creating products. This is what we call innovation. Entrepreneur, innovation is closely associated with entrepreneurship. Whenever you see new ideas coming up, there's a great, there's somebody called an entrepreneur behind them. And whenever you see new products coming up, there's somebody with a creative mind. But not all creative people go out and generate uh, uh, ideas. And entrepreneurs initiate change. Uh, change is extremely important. And the biggest driver of change is innovation. You can see. Uh, creativity creates innovations, innovations creates change. And this is the role of an entrepreneur. And for you as a investor, where, where do you see yourselves in this? Talking about the change that has just taken place or is taking place because of the coronavirus pandemic. How are we reacting? How are we responding to this? So entrepreneurs create value. This is the output in terms of products, services, profits, or in an entrepreneurial university, we knowledge. Entrepreneurs solve societal problems. So we have different types of entrepreneurs. Uh, we have the individual who is called the entrepreneur and the organization who is called the intrapreneur or what we now call the corporate entrepreneur. And for you to be able to be a good entrepreneurial university, you must understand what we call the antecedents to corporate entrepreneurship. That is, those are the things that you must put in place for you to be a good entrepreneurial university. So uh, what constitutes an entrepreneurial university? These are the key things, leadership and governance. What kind of leadership? Visionary leadership. Leadership that sees things differently. Leadership that is not stuck in the mind. Leadership that is forward looking. Leadership that has strategic, strategic view of things and good governance in place. You know, good governance, being fair, being having various things that enable you to move the institution ahead. Of course, the organizational structure. While this makes the Nobel University, uh, it's also the major hindrance to it, as you see when you look at some of the aspects. So the organizational structure is extremely important. The flatter the structure, the more entrepreneurial it is. The deeper the hierarchy, the more difficult it is. We also have structures of getting ideas from people. Do you allow ideas to come from, from below to the top? That is how ideas, new ideas, new innovations are going to come up. And of course, uh, support from stakeholders. You know, management itself must support. 
If top managers don't support uh, ideas from below, you can't succeed. If, if your stakeholders, your council, your public, the press cannot support you, you can't succeed. If the press is out to take you out, you definitely will not live, you will not succeed as an organization. And you can see it in, in some of the organizations that we see around. Uh, of course, entrepreneurship teaching is also one of the aspects that are important in, in getting the organization to be entrepreneurial, the, the, the university to be entrepreneurial. And a culture of entrepreneurship, a culture of promoting new ideas, a culture of, of tolerance, a culture of allowing people to make mistakes. All this is part of uh, uh, what can really constitute an entrepreneurial university. Bringing in young staff who have wonderful ideas, adopting technologies that come up. Uh, uh, we adopted online teaching many years back and I have been at the forefront, and I'm one of the oldest people in, in MOOCs. But I use uh, you know, e-learning to be able to teach my people in Arua and Barara, Jinja at the same time. So that culture of entrepreneurship must exist in the organization. How are people adopting to the modern technologies that are there? Of course, the market focus. Define your university as the needs of your students five years from now. That is your university. If you cannot see the needs of your stu potential you, students, five years from now, you don't have an institution. Of course, if it is government, we keep on, we, 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 we go on, you know, we, we somehow we live on, you know, but uh, not, not in the way that is entrepreneurial, not in a competitive manner. You don't create value that way, you know. Uh, of course, you must also be flexible. This is what constitutes an entrepreneurial university. Uh, what is not an entrepreneurial university? It's not a startup school because uh, I hear many institutions saying, uh, you know, we are creating entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't think that's right. You see, it's, it's like leadership. Create in an organization conditions for different leaders to emerge and succeed in terms of the succession planning. So even in universities, create institutions that, you know, uh, create an environment that enables entrepreneurs to emerge rather than to simply say, whoever comes of, out of that must start a business. And uh, an entrepreneurial university is not something that simply adopts business practices. Of course, one of the key things of entrepreneurship is being efficient, as you see, but it's not simply adopting them as the way they are. University is different. You know, uh, in, university is very, very different. Uh, you know, researchers, you know very well that when you're writing a novel, you build up the tension to the end. In research, the problem must be stated right from the beginning. That, so it's not a business at times. It's not an assembly line where you simply, you know, put students on the line and get them out. It's not an economic development agency, but the university can start business ventures with life, besides the teaching aspects. And this is not easy also. I, I was uh, uh, a chairman of the commercial board units in Makere for a long time. We structured them. And uh, somehow we never got the right thing in these institutions. I must say that in MOOCs, we have desisted from going into them because of spending too much time on them if, if you really don't skim them out very well. So it's a, refle a reflection of entrepreneurship, but not necessarily something that you want to do unless if you have a way of ensuring that it does not consume your time. When you got into MOOCs, I'll tell you something. The first problem I had was uh, we, we have no salt in the, in the dining hall. I asked how much does it cost? It was 60,000. But salt can cause a strike in the university. So you spend a lot of time on non academic issues. You must be able, uh, as an entrepreneur university, must be able to balance out these things in such a way that you are able to do your academics, but you are also able to ensure welfare of both the staff and the students. So uh, 
why an entrepreneur university? Why do we need to be entrepreneurial as, as, as institutions? Uh, there's need for us to, 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 to adopt changing conditions. Universities in the previous century were slow to change. They were universities, they were places, you know, when I joined Makerere, most of the professors were, were wearing the bitengis and they had unkempt hair, and we respected them that way. Uh, because I was a young man then, I wanted to find the whole fitting in, so I decided to wear suits and white shirts and ties. And I created that culture in the business school today. Most of my young lecturers want to wear a tie and, you know. Uh, so you must be able, as an entrepreneur university, you must be able to adopt changing environment. You need to stay relevant. If you are not relevant, you know, you, if you can't be relevant, uh, then you disappear. You become obsolete. Who wants to talk to you if you're not relevant? And uh, you need to use your resources effectively efficiently and effectively. Resources, we are, we are all short of resources. We want to use our money very well. And if you not, if you do not have an entrepreneurial mind that looks at value, then you will not use your resources well. I, yesterday I was presenting something in the you know, uh, meeting. And they said, why don't you have vehicles? I said, vehicles are a waste of money. We only have two vehicles for the principal and deputy principal and pool vehicles. We don't have a vehicle. Why don't you give beans vehicles? I said, they, I give them fuel. Uh, it's more efficient that way. And uh, so I told them about the concept of revenue consequences of capital expenditure. You're going to get money from somebody, buy a vehicle, then you have to run it. You need fuel, you need maintenance. And then you need books, you need internet. You need, so. All these are very important. The entrepreneurial mind is going to look at all this and say, how do I create the greatest value out of the resources that I have? So simply, rather than simply have 10 vehicles out there, why don't I have two that, that can do the job? You know, and why don't I give more value to the people that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that we work together? We had another interesting case when we went to Nakawa. We found there were staff houses there. One of the things I did was call it kicked the staff out of those houses, turned them into offices, and that was cast. Uh, Barunua, all that. But after three, four years, two people came to me and said, Thank you for chasing me out of the house. I said, What? You see, now I have my own house. But, and personally, I'd realized that when I was in Makerere, after 10 years of comfort in a flat, I got an accident. And, uh, and around that time, Professor Mudola died. We used to stay in the same flat. After three months, we, we, we said he's irreplaceable, but the, the family should get out of the house. I realized that uh, uh, this were, these were clear for fit in terms of uh, the, you, you uh, as an entrepreneurial mind must look for value and create it. You must use your resources well. So you need to collect more resources and that way you need to be an entrepreneurial mind. For instance, to manage a commercial unit. You need to introduce new programs and new products. This is one of the nightmares in this country. Uh, it's good that National Council is listening in today. If we are not able to adapt to the changing conditions and bring new programs on board, as a country, we shall continue to teach things that are way out of you know, uh, of the syllabus that are way out being practiced in the, country, in the world. But of course, Uganda is still very backward. We still use holes to dig after 100 years. Yeah, so maybe, yes, our curriculum can still think about holes as something to teach us. But if we don't have new products that are competitive in the market, as a country, we shall stagnate because we shall not be creating new knowledge. So entrepreneurship is the way that's going to bring this. Uh, teaching it and practicing it is what is going to do this. And there's a need for us to change and grow. There's a growing population in this country. There's a need for us to be able to grow, to be able to serve these institutions. But this growth must be related, relevant to the current conditions. What are the challenges of an entrepreneurial university? Leadership and governance. If you have leaders who, you know, uh, want to sit up there and be, be bosses, then the institution is going to change. 
uh, some people ask me, why do you teach? I say, I'm, I'm, my, my, I'm, my, I'm not a, my profession is not a principal, my profession is a professor. I need to be updated with knowledge. Therefore, I go to the class and teach so that I'm relevant. Uh, you know, of course, we have challenges in public universities committees. Committees are very good, but if you want to kill an idea, give it a committee, it will kill it very well. You want to kill an idea, form a committee. You know, uh, of course, there's, there's a need for balance. Egos fly up out there as individuals and they do lots of things. They're wonderful balance. Committees can be very good in terms of inclusion, generating ideas from different people, but they can also be very big problem. Universities are under committees. And one of the things that about committees so slow and they kill wonderful ideas. Bureaucracy. We all have policies. And what's a policy? A policy is a guide to the thinking and action. But at, our policies are not guides, they are rules. Don't do this, don't do that. And when you don't do this, don't do that, you are, you are creating inertia, you are preventing innovation from taking place. It took us five years in the Faculty of Commerce to get Makere University to accept to run private programs. We, they looked at us as crazy people. But today, I think 90% of the students in, public, in universities are private students. And we need to keep on changing this. But this is because of governance systems and bureaucracies. Funding systems are challenges with no university. Uh, in the developing country that is private, that can succeed. That's what I've seen. In MOOCs, we've generated lots of money. I think we, in terms of yield, we have, we've had the highest yield in, in, in public institutions, even when you bring private institutions. But it's not possible for you to run a university that way without grants, without government support. The organizational culture this can also be a problem. You know, uh, I remember consulting for one university when it was being started, started up. Uh, they had 200 universities. They wanted a position of BASA, deputy BASA, assistant BASA. I said, why do you need all these people? Why don't you simply have a registrar come secretary for the next three, four years? And uh, well, see, we need all this bureaucracy, the structures, the people in place, but it's top heavy, it needs money, it costs money to run. Uh, our campuses have developed in a very interesting manner. You have an, uh, an administrator there who starts the place. As the numbers increase, you have uh, heads of department, directors and other people. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that with, uh, I think about 1,500 students in, in Jinja campus, we don't have full buses there yet. Because it's not cost effective. But, you know, these are challenges that you get, but you must have this in place. You must have that in place. And uh, the law, the law is very interesting. The law tells us that you must have two deputy vice chancellors. Uh, so, I don't know how many you have in Bishop Stewart and how many students you have. MOOBS has about 20,000 students, but the law does not allow us to have a second deputy. You, know, you see what I'm talking about? So these are the challenges that you get or because of bureaucracy, governance systems, laws, policies, procedures. Uh, yeah, lastly, is entrepreneurship the solution? The answer is yes, but, but we need funds from government. I think in this country, for me, I have said and I'll say, governments must fund sciences fully, right from primary school to university. It must fund sciences. This country will not grow without government looking at science as a key instigator of growth, of change in, in this country. Government must provide infrastructure to universities. Without that, really, we are, well, some of us become, is it glorified secondary schools? That's a common word we use. Without infrastructure, really, you can't have an institution. In the developed country like the US, people grant money. They, you find a building by Kaufman, by, by, by Mellon, by so-and-so. 
That's how they, that's their structure. But in our country, with our resources, I've tried to get, uh, with due respect, uh, mention names, Wavamuno, uh, Murana, put up buildings for us. They don't have the interest. They don't see what is in it, them, in, in it for them. So we don't have that culture. They, that means that if we are going to succeed, education is primary, is very, very essential. Government must put the money in, in there. And yes, we, we, entrepreneurship is a solution because it enables you to adopt changing conditions. It enables you to adopt modern technologies. Right now, if, if it was not COVID, I would have driven all the way to Bishop Stewart to attend a conference, but it's so efficient because of this modern technology. Of course, there are things that you miss. You miss a hug from a friend, you miss you know, sharing a meal together, but you know, they, they, there must be a trade-off. And entrepreneurship enables you to focus on the needs of your customers. I've said, you as an organization, and when I say that, look at MOOBs. MOOBs, the, MOOBs five years now will be determined by the needs of the future customers. That's what we are looking at. What do they need five years from now? And with this COVID, what is required now? That your strategic plan must change accordingly. You must remove inefficiencies in all respects. This entrepreneurship, it maximizes utilization of, of resources that they have. And you must look out and search for opportunities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for giving that opportunity to make those remarks about entrepreneurship, whether it's the solution to our public institution or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope members who are listening in, you have just heard from Professor Barunya. Professor, whenever you speak, I'm always challenged and motivated. And now mm -hmm. you can see what you have given to us, too much on the table, food for thought. I want you to pay attention to all of you that you check in the chat. There are several comments I'm seeing that are coming, people are appreciating, people are saying, uh, this is the way to go. Uh, I, I don't know if I have other words better than that, but I want to say thank you very much, Professor. Uh, on uh, next week, Anemo, you will be on your table. <laughs> yes, you have given us yes, at least uh, one PhD program with BSU. I'm um, yes, sure yes, we, 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 Professor Gasham, the dean, faculty of business. These uh, are national resources. These are national resources. We need sure. to share. Uh, these are national resources. We need to share. We need to create people. We need to build capacity. We can uh, offer a PhD to one of your staff, maybe to you. come in for the next three years, and we can offer a master's degree to one of your staff. We want good staff uh, for the wow. next three years. Let's do an MOU next week, and we do this, we improve this country. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. that's what it means having visitors at home. You will <laughs> okay. always get good things. Now, Professor Marunya, I'm very excited. That's the number one I, I pick, and I can see we are moving further. We have an MOU with Makere. Now we are going to have one with MOOBs. And I'm very much aware you already have one with uh, UBTEB. You are going to run those business courses for which you have started. You are saying we should develop new programs. I think this is the way to go. I want to say uh, time is not on our side. Time is not our friend always. He has said very many good things. Leadership and governance. That is the very reason why we, have, we are here. Governance is involved. I've told the chair council is around. The owners of the university, that's why the bishop has called you. And you have spoken the right team with the right package. And I can see we are all coming on board. Uh, then you have hinted on issues that council has been grappling with of a smaller and arena management, not a heavy top. And I can see for years, BSU has been operating maybe under entrepreneurship skills, but we, we didn't you know someone mentioned it there. 
But Professor Baringa, before you go away, may you make a comment on the university? We have agreed that entrepreneurship, all our students must study entrepreneurship. How did you do it at MOOBS? Briefly, just maybe two minutes. Yeah, um, what we did is uh, there are some, what we've done is we've got what we call the foundation courses. Mm -hmm. uh, foundation courses and then the core courses and then the integrating courses. Of course, you know, we, we take this out to our parent in Makere and we you know, at times have disputes when mm. they want to say, distinguish the programs. So in terms of foundation courses, uh, the common word, and entrepreneurship is an integrating course for us. Entrepreneurship, communication, strategy, these are integrating courses. Once people have studied all these, then they go to study these courses. So everybody in the school must, do, must go through an entrepreneurship course. Mm -hmm. And the, in, the, in the other course which we did, which was the Uganda economy, I think that was a course we invented ourselves so that we were able to relate these two so that we can be in a position to create entrepreneurs uh, or give an idea to people to create entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Members, time is not on our side, but we are so far very grateful, but don't go away. We still have a discussion. We are reserving time for questions and comments that people are asking in the chat. And I'm uh, requesting public relations office to be picking some questions and send them directly to the presenters. So at yes, the time of discussion, they will go straight to their comments. Uh, welcome with me. I'm going to introduce our lady, Professor Betty Ezati. She's the Dean School of Education, Makere University, and also the former chair of Governing Council of National Curriculum Development Center, that's where curriculum is rolled out, is discussed and dispensed. Who is Ezati? Ezati has a PhD in education, gender issues in higher education from Makere University. She has a master's in education and of course bachelor's in education from Makere University. She has several diplomas and certificates in education, management, organizational management from Germany. She has been doing gender focused research methodologies, gender management, and uh, social policy. She is a member of Senate of Makere University. She's a coordinator of school practice or school practice officer examination officer of the School of Education. Uh, she's a member of the task force for the National Task Force for Lower Secondary School Curriculum Reforms. Uh, she's a, a board member of Makere College. She's also uh, a governing council member of Uganda Petroleum Institute Chugumba. She's a board member of Waschana Foundation. I think there are very many things. She will talk about them herself. Stir Up Education, she's an advisory member of the committee. She edits a journal online from Arbata Calgary. She's a renowned publisher. And she has supervised a number of PhDs and masters. With me, she's a lady of integrity. Welcome. Let us welcome Professor Ezati. You are welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that very expansive uh, introduction. Uh, and definitely some of them I I no longer uh, participate in them. For example, the issue of coordination of school practice, SP, but I, I did participate in it, but not anymore uh, since I took over office uh, of the Dean. So I'll, I'll just like to share my screen. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I was given this topic 
uh, to speak to us. And um, at that time, I, I, I think the understanding was that I was still the chair of NCDC. Uh, and I, I did notify the person that my term ended in August. And uh, so for the last uh, two months, I have, I'm not longer the chair, but I'm still in the membership of that uh, board. Uh, I was the chair of NDC, NCDC for six years. And so I did see the lower secondary school curriculum uh, go through all the challenges that it went through and finally uh, accepted and uh, being implemented. There are still challenges, but usually you're better off moving than stalling in one place. You learn from the mistakes that you make. So I'm actually glad that finally that curriculum is being enrolled. I mean, being, being implemented. Uh, one of the key things in that curriculum that really, uh, that I really like is the fact that a student can take up the vocational component as well the academic component and actually graduate with two different certificates. Now, this really, if we do it effectively, it should uh, be able to uh, improve uh, the products that get out of our school system. Having said that, uh, just to move very briefly into my presentation, I'm going to look at the introduction and then uh, which I partly mentioned functions of NCDC and how NCDC and higher education institutions influence each other. And then how NCDC has tried to align secondary school curriculum uh, to, to higher education. Um, in terms of uh, introduction, we all know that uh, NCDC is autonomous. It's uh, part of the Ministry of Education um, organ or entity for that matter. And it's responsible for development of educational curriculum right from preschool up to tertiary institutions. Uh, I will speak a little bit to some of the challenges around this a little bit uh, later. In terms of functions, um, NCDC has several functions. Uh, first among them is, hope, of course, curriculum review or curriculum reform for that matter. Our recent curriculum was a reformed curriculum, but many times we have a reviewed curriculum. And um, they also uh, focus on testing. Usually when NCDC uh, designs a curriculum or reforms a curriculum, it comes up with how that curriculum is supposed to be assessed. And that is then part of UNEP and UNEB works with that to actually uh, get assessment for the different levels of education. NCDC also coordinates implementation of the curriculum. So when curriculum gets into the schools, NCDC is expected to follow up this curriculum and see how they are implementing it. And that actually takes me to the other aspect of NCDC um, uh, function that is capacity building. Capacity building for those who are implementing the curriculum, capacity building to guide in, impl uh, in implementation of a improved curriculum, but also the pedagogy. Usually when a curriculum is introduced, many times the expected pedagogy is different from the pedagogy that would have been practiced by the, in the previous curriculum. And so you need that tilt for the teachers to actually be able to effectively implement that curriculum. And that component really speaks to us in higher education. If you realize many higher education in Uganda, there is always a faculty of education. And that means that the products that are coming from those faculties of education or schools of education should be able to actually fit immediately they get into our secondary schools and teach the students as expected by NCDC. 
and CDC also does a lot of research and their research is related to how the curriculum is being implemented, how teachers are effectively implementing the curriculum. And usually this research is very informative, even to higher education institutions, because if you are, for example, training teachers for secondary education, then you need to read some of the research reports that come out of NCDC in order for you to be able to uh, improve the training of your teachers. Then NCDC will, of course, draft the scheme of work. They draft the textbooks. So when you see textbooks being produced by the, the publishers, they normally get the prototype from NCDC, and then they use that uh, to produce textbooks, in addition to teachers' manuals and, um, and uh, the specimens, for example. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we need to look at role of NCD and role of higher education as mutually beneficial because each tend to influence each other. And I give few examples here. If you look at uh, our secondary school system, the NCDC will always add additional subject if there is need for that subject as far as society is concerned. And in the past five or so years, you realize that, for example, ICT is now a subject for a level, uh, almost compulsory for everybody who is doing um, uh, combinations that are related in the, in, that are humanity based. And then uh, the science based do uh, uh, additional math. Now that means as soon as NCDC says ICT is actually compulsory for humanities-based students, then universities that produce teachers for this uh, secondary school institution should have realized this and prepared teachers for that. But you find that many times we are taken unaware and then we begin to be reactive instead of being uh, uh, proactive. NCTC sometimes introduce new subjects based on demands and uh, Prof. Balunya has just talked about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship as a subject in our secondary school started long time ago, but are we really preparing teachers who can teach these students? And how are we preparing these teachers? Entrepreneurship moves out from being a theoretical to a practical subject. How do you act actually makes to business that, that that to me is a critical issue so that somebody gets out from here with this practical information i remember a few i think last year we had um we we had this uh, collaboration and prof balunya may not know but uh, it's mobs and then we also had a uh, school of education come on board and iuiu board and we did train our students in the school of education and at the end of the semester, students were marketing their products and they actually got money of it, money out of it. So that's the kind of entrepreneurship that I'm talking about. How do we in higher education institution actually prepare for that? Given that NCDC has said this subject is an A-level subject, it's a combination. And you may even find that some higher education institutions, and here I'm focusing more really at universities, higher education institutions have not even factored in entrepreneurship as a, a subject that can be used to admit people into certain courses. So we tend to take long. On the other hand, however, higher education institutions can include new courses. Uh, I'm sorry for mentioning subjects, can include new courses in their admission requirements. And once that is done, it directly impacts on secondary schools. And if a subject is not in place, NCDC immediately moves in to uh, include that subject. Uh, higher education institutions provide guidelines for requirements for a program. And those guidelines directly impact on uh, secondary schools. And definitely NCDC acts on it. Um, and I, I, I the last uh, statement there is about uh, a skill program in terms of combination. For example, if somebody is doing uh, BSc or BA, what, 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 what subjects are needed? How do we quickly adjust this so that we are actually moving more or less at par 
uh, with what NCD is doing as institutions of higher learning. Now, there are several things that NCDC does um, to actually ensure that the curriculum is aligned. One is that the panel that writes the curriculum for NCDC come from secondary schools, but also it is compulsory. It's in the standing order that two of the members in any panel must come from higher education. And the idea behind this is that higher education will directly provide an input to a secondary school curriculum, but also at the same time, high, the, the panel members are able to get insight into what universities are doing so that the, the, the curriculum kind of um, one leads to another. You don't have a big gap from one to another. Uh, that is the whole essence. So it's, it's by policy that members of higher education participate in NCDC uh, panel writing. The only challenge around this is there is a tendency usually to go in and pick the subject best people. And so you have somebody who is teaching, let's say in the, in the humanities, maybe school faculty of arts, maybe faculty of science, maybe business, those ones will be picked and they speak to this. But how about having, for example, somebody from veterinary school or somebody from um, medical school being part of this panel so that they speak to how biology and chemistry is taught, so that they speak to how mathematics is taught and ETC. So that component is still a bit uh, challenging. But we also need to note that NCDC is a critical stakeholder when we review our curriculum. And so as institutions of higher learning, every time we are reforming, every time we are reviewing, every time we are introducing a new curriculum, we actually need to get NCDC on board as a stakeholder. We should not forget them because they then are able to help us understand what they're doing, but they're also able to pick the thinking in higher education and take it back to uh, inform the review process of NCDC uh, curriculum. NCDC also provide in service, and this is opportunity that actually uh, higher education institutions can take. If you are going through a curriculum reform, NCDC has staff who actually train, just like uh, many uh, a teach, uh, faculty of education, they train in curriculum writing. So if you really people, you can also get there. They also provide uh, consultancy. And in all these, they are actually focusing on how best can they ensure that the curriculum that they are offering can take people who are able to do the courses and the programs that are offered by uh, higher education institutions. And uh, still speaking to that, uh, the role of, I, of NCDC, I've already mentioned a bit of it, issues of organizing courses. They have not been doing that much, but in the law, they are actually expected to do that. And they're expected to hold conferences. NCDC actually held a conference two years ago. And right now, uh, NCDC is the, the directorate that is um, housing the Africa Curriculum Association, which is actually affiliated to African Union. And so they speak to the curriculum in Africa. And um, these are opportunity for us as higher education institution to listen in what is happening in the region, what is happening in Africa, how can we use it to actually ensure that the product we're getting speak to those needs uh, in the region. Um, and again, we know that the students, I've mentioned this already, the teachers we train must be able to teach the curriculum that NCDC passes out. One of our biggest challenge is in a failure of our teachers to effectively interpret the curriculum as well as effectively teach it the way it is designed to be taught. And so you find that in the document, the curriculum is beautiful, but the implementation 
makes it problematic and the product definitely will have challenges. NCDC disseminates their research findings. Actually every year there is a dissemination for NCDC research. And um, again, it's opportunity for higher education institutions to take up so that they fit into this. There is that we really need to build with NCDC as a body in charge of developing a curriculum for students whom we receive in higher education uh, institutions. However, having said that, really there are, there are many things that um, are not quite well, and I do make few observations in relation to that. Uh, one is that we know that by NCDC, but universities develop their own curriculum. That sometimes also creates a bit of problems. How can we make our graduates comparable? How can we make our graduates even better so that when, when I am somebody who is recruiting, I know that this graduate is competent in A, but has this additional competence that this other graduate maybe does not have. And then you have a comparative advantage over the other. So that calls for us to rethink the way we actually then prepare people. So as you work through your new strategic plan, actually you, you are even in a better position now given the challenges that we've gone through to really think what kind of university do we need? What kind of product do we need to get out of this university? Higher education institutions are not as fast in changing their curriculum. Uh, many will bear with me that apart from the processes that also take long, but universities take time to review their curriculum. And sometimes by the time they're reviewing, so much has happened in society how can we be futuristic so that you foresee some of these things and you're able to factor it in your curriculum? Are we able to plan 10 years ahead and say that the student coming out of our university 10 years from now must have the following competences? And then you just keep adjusting a few things because your goal is very clear. For example, lower levels of, ed of education move to competence-based education. I think just moving there as institutions of higher learning. I don't know about uh, Bishop Stewart, how it is right now. Uh, interaction of subjects in secondary schools and yet some of those subjects are still not uh, in universities. Transition from secondary to university is still problematic because of the pedagogy sometimes used in institutions of higher learning. Uh, colleagues present here do know that staff in higher institutions are extremely intelligent, but intelligence alone cannot make you a good communicator, especially a communication that is related to passing over some information. And so our pedagogy sometimes tend to be the way we were taught not necessarily the way it should be. And because of that, the students struggle to actually fit in institutions of higher learning. And I'm just saying higher education institutions need to forecast. Higher education institution needs to appropriately respond to needs of society. And, and the secondary school curriculum as well. And for this, we really need to to be learning institutions, learning organization. We need, first of all, to understand ourselves, you know, and your strategic plan has actually brought out some of those things. What are you good at? What, what do you need to improve? And, and when, you, when you understand yourself, then use that to actually improve your practices. And um, above all, promote promote team learning, promote collaboration, so that all of you move together towards this goal that you are planning to move to and establish a culture of inquiry. Uh, people normally, when, when people talk about research and inquiry, then they think about this huge, huge, huge money. I always look at research even as starting from my class 
how am I performing? Can I research on my action in terms of teaching? And if I'm able to do that, can I share it with others so that they know that in this challenge that I had in class, this is how I maneuvered it and my class went well. And in that way you improve teaching, but you are also building a culture of research. And that research may not require so, so much money. I know the challenges around money in terms of research, but this build this culture of innovativeness, don't kill it. And I think with that, you will be able to move uh, into a better university. So as I conclude, we do know that the overall education system of a country, really from childhood to university, depends on the product that come from it. So in higher education, we, we cannot claim to be doing a very good job if down there, the job is not as good. So we need to begin to pay attention to what is down there and support what is down there if we are going to have a good uh, quality student that comes to our university. So we need to be mindful of the courses that are offered in school and we need to include the new subjects uh, immediately they come up uh, in our institution. We need to we need to track, uh, I mean, as NCDC in tracks uh, curriculum, they need to disseminate to us. But higher, as higher education institutions, we need to continuously do tracer studies. Thank you very much, Professor Zati. Are you hearing me? Hello? Are you hearing me? Uh, Professor Zati, you are off. But um, uh, you are yes, hearing me. Hear you. you are not hearing me? Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. We really, you deserve a very big hand clap. And I'm sorry to all of you who are listening in and who are attending. Uh, Professor Zati needed at least uh, more than an hour to, to give her presentation, especially when it comes to issues of curriculum. And I want to draw your attention. The chat people are saying you are the best consultant on the curriculum review. I take note of two key things you have said. Entrepreneurship, we need to see how other courses how we admit students, those who have come with entrepreneurship to our universities. Number two, NCDC needs to know which new programs or new subjects we are brought on board. We must alert them as well as they always alert us. I thank you so much. That is very great. I want to go straight and introduce Associate Professor Aaron Mushengesi the Vice Chancellor, Uganda Christian University. Who is he? He holds a diploma in education. That's why he started. I thought you would say from Bishop Stuart University. That's where I thought you started from. He got a Bachelor of Arts, a first class honors, which is very rare from Makerere University. He got a master's and a PhD from Connect, Connect Cut USA, United States of America. He is the current VC, I think maybe like two months down the road. Before he came to UCU, he was from Makerere as the associate professor and was also the dean of the School of Languages, Literature and Communication, College of Humanities, Social Sciences, Makere University. He headed the department before of journalism and mass communication. He is a chair council of African New University, and I want to take the honor to recognize someone from African New University. I know you are attending, uh, Professor. Marimu Mosheshe, you are welcome to listen to your chair. 
uh, he was the coordinator of development partnerships. His CV is very rich. I may not be in position to say everything, but Professor Mshenjezi, you are part of us. You are mentor, our friend. We have a memorandum of understanding with Uganda Christian University. We share many things in common. UCU is the one that mentored BSU. The degrees of Bishop Sweat University, at first they were coming from UCU. So whatever we say, you are our fathers, our mothers, you are our parents. So when you are here, you are at home. Actually, feel free. Professor Aaron Mshenjezi, welcome at home. <laughs> Thank you, Ma uh, Professor Maud. Come to Tennessee. Okay. Uh, Maud and I have known each other for the last, uh, I think, 32 years from our days in Barara. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you uh, on this important topic on utilizing ICT and e learning in higher education. I, I did share my, my slides with your IT team, PR team, but let me see if I can find it yeah, and share. Are you able to see it? Okay. Right. I am seeing it. Maybe put slide view, full slide view. Yes. There we go. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, mod using modern ICT and e-learning technologies in higher education. And I'm very glad that the previous speakers have hinted on the importance of uh, uh, really rethinking our modern university. I like Professor Bolognua's, uh, uh, you know, talk about forging an entrepreneurial university. And if we are to move forward beyond this COVID-19 pandemic, one of the, the hallmarks of our uh, rethinking the universities will have to involve also adopting ICTs and uh, open distance and e-learning technologies. I know you know these terms, but uh, as a teacher, as a trained teacher, we're not supposed to assume that people know because we begin from known to unknown. By ICTs, we mean a broad range of communication technologies, including the internet and wireless networks, cell phones, computers, uh, the projector, software application, video conferencing technology, and social networking platforms, as well as other media applications. So often we talk about uh, the soft and the hard uh, technologies, uh, which all work together in terms of the machines and the, tech and the, the, the other uh, softwares that make the machines work well. With e-learning uh, technologies, we refer to computer-based learning that uses forms of media which seamlessly uh, help us deliver text, that is words, audio, voice, or images and animation, as well as uh, uh, video to audiences through internet connectivity. Or in some advanced societies, you, you can also do it through satellite transmission especially if you're using, uh, say, uh, TV or radio as one of the, the modes of teaching. However, online learning uh, is only an aspect of this whole scheme that we call open distance and e-learning technologies. Sometimes we, we talk about learning management systems to refer to these e-learning platforms. At UC, we use uh, Moodle, but we are moving now towards Canvas. So we have also built a Canvas platform, uh, which is running seamlessly with Moodle. 
And these we are trying to augment with other social networking platforms. So we do have uh, Zoom, we do have um, uh, social media sites. Uh, we are very active on Twitter and, and, and Facebook. And all these are meant to complement the, the Odell technologies because they help with personal and group interaction, especially among our learners and teachers. So VCBSU, the question I want to ask you and ask ourselves first is, are we utilizing ICTs in education? And if we are, we are utilizing them, to what extent are we utilizing them? How is your ICT infrastructure on the BSU campus uh, or UCU campus and other universities? For example, our connectivity at, US, at UCU right now is about 85% in terms of Wi-Fi. And for us, we have both our UCU Wi-Fi uh, and also EDUROM. EDUROM is a very, very good international uh, network platform, which I would encourage you to get on BSC if you have not yet subscribed, because it allows you to move all over the world uh, with your connectivity. So if your phone is connected to EDUROM or laptop, as you travel through Europe or Asia or America, you still be able to get access to EDUROM. And I, I think B, U, UC was the first university in Uganda to subscribe to Eduro. It's a very good uh, network, Wi-Fi network. What about the local area network? Is your campus fully plugged uh, to local area network? Are all your offices connected? Uh, the library and the, the, the teaching the buildings on campus. Uh, for UCU, I can say that our connectivity in terms of local area network is very good. Um, and then access to computers per capita. How is the access to computers in our universities for students and for teaching staff and administrative staff? Do we have enough laboratories, for example, where students who don't have machines can be able to access uh, the internet and the library resources? Uh, at UC, we have, we have a policy that requires every first year student to buy a laptop. So our recent survey when we, we decided to go with e-learning, <coughs> for example, uh, showed us that uh, about 95% of UC students uh, have gadgets that enable them to connect to our campus networks. So that is one of the deliberate things we need to do to improve our, cap our per capita accessibility to computers. The other one is overhead projectors in classrooms. I don't know how you're doing at BSU. Uh, I am new at UCU, but a few buildings I've been to, I can see they have projectors there which are mounted, uh, but I've not toured all the buildings to see whether they have these technologies in place. Uh, ideally, even lecturers should have uh, lecterns in, the, in each lecture room, well equipped with internet, with a, a computer that you can use to teach, uh, and then you project on the screens. That is the ideal that we need to move towards. What about video conferencing facilities? Uh, have, you, have you, for example, subscribed to Zoom? Because Zoom is now the, a, a very important uh, uh, for conferencing facility that universities are using. So we need to uh, buy licenses. But there are also other sites like uh, Microsoft Teams that you can use for video conferencing. Or simply build your own if you have the, the resources. Again, this is important. For example, when, we, when later I talk about having e-meetings so that Professor Maud, you can be able to 
to hold meetings with your deans, even when they are not on campus, uh, seamlessly without any, any problem. And I think COVID has also woken us up to realize that we don't always have to have physical meetings because they waste time, the people have to travel and drive cars and, uh, and, and, and then we prepare tea for them <laughs> during the meeting. But if we can adopt uh, video conferencing, conferencing technology, then we can be able to even conduct online meetings like we're doing now uh, without uh, incurring much costs. Now, the other is uh, deploying software applications in our campus life. At, at UC, we have built uh, what we call the Alpha MIS, the Alpha Management Information System, built from scratch by our IT uh, directorate, the directorate of IT, ICT services. And so right now we are deploying it in results management, uh, in processing transcripts, uh, recently, we did pre-entry tests for law applicants, for medical students, and for dental, uh, dental students who were applying to join UCU. And the numbers were quite big, but we could not bring them uh, onto campus. But we used our, uh, our online resources to interview close to 870 law applicants online and it was successful. So this is uh, one way to, to utilize ICTs in HR management. Uh, people should be able now to apply for jobs online and we can even interview them online and maybe have a first face uh, just to check the people we're dealing with. As well as procurement. And at UC we are moving towards having alpha or the modules in alpha being able to do all these things. Uh, it cuts costs, it eases university operations, and it improves transparency. Because when you have to deal with a lot of paperwork, uh, remember these are costs that you're incurring to buy paper and toner and to, and then the time you invest in movement from one office to another, following up uh, transactions. Now, the latest uh, innovation we have made at UCU is a software we call Ichagua. Ichagua is a Kiswahili word meaning choose, which we are now deploying for guild elections. We are going to hold guild elections next month in November, and they are going to be done online through our Ichagua software. So these are IC, ICT innovations that we all need to embrace to be able to tackle uh, emerging challenges. What about creating a paperless campus? How far have, have you at BSU, for example, gone towards uh, having e-offices, e-meetings, and e-timetables? By e-offices, I mean if uh, as VC you sign a letter or a circular, do you have to print 500 copies and distribute them manually? Or rather, do you sign and scan it and then email it to the respective stakeholders? If you're holding a, a council meeting or a Senate meeting, do you have to print all these tons and tons of paper uh, and then uh, carry them to meetings? One thing I've liked at UC is that five years ago, they already started e-meetings. So now uh, council and Senate and all departmental meetings and faculty meetings are done online. By that, I mean, you come to a meeting, but you have a laptop or a tablet, which you then use to access documents on cloud. So these are ways of uh, helping us to, 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 to utilize ICTs to create a modern university. But what about also digitizing our, our, our records? What are we learning from the recent fire at Makerere, which destroyed the main building? with all the, the historical records for staff and for uh, the finance department and all that, we need to digitize our records. It's an expensive venture, but we need to move uh, and get it done. 
there are companies now in Uganda that can help you store your, your archives so that you don't have to kill a lot of space in your buildings, uh, keeping tons and tons of documents dating 100 years. There are service providers now that can take care of your documents and even digitize them for you if you want. And then uh, as a university, you only operate with the digital uh, copies. Now, COVID-19 has also taught us to use social media platforms to ease communication, especially with our students, whom, as you know, are really .com. They are more .com than us. They are always online. So let's find them where they are. Let's find our students and staff where they are. And that is on social media. So Facebook and Twitter and all these Instagram sites are no longer luxury for a modern university. We need to subscribe to those sites because that's where our partners are, are operating from. So let's find them there. And then let's create informative and interactive websites. Uh, in many of our universities, including UCU, when I look at the websites, they are not interactive enough. And they don't have even full information on who is the staff in, uh, who is a member of staff in this department, who is the lecturer, who is, what is the area of specialization, uh, what is their research profile. Because such information is important when we talk about networking and building partnerships, like the one you, you referred to with the university in Canada. The universities come and look at our websites. They look at the website for the Faculty of Business or Faculty of uh, ICT, and they, they, they cannot find information about our staff and their specializations. And that sends the wrong message, but perhaps you are not a, a very serious university, even when you have all the information but now uh, with this, in this age, information is power. So let's share information. Let's not uh, keep the wonderful things we have done to ourselves. What about online learning? I know we have been cleared by the National Council for Education. And I assume BSU, you are, you are also cleared to begin online studies and assessment. Now, rolling out e-learning is being seen as a short-term emergency response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps that's why the National Council for Education is giving us licenses initially for one year. Uh, but my view is that we need to embrace uh, e-learning technologies really as a tool for the future, not just for the crisis moment we're in now, because Online education is going to uh, make education more accessible. There are very many people in, the, in, in offices, in, uh, in different places who don't have time to come and sit at BSU uh, in a lecture room or at UCU for three years or five years. But if we, if we create on, uh, online uh, degrees, uh, for these people, perhaps mm -hmm. with a blended element, because we also uh, need them to have a, a campus experience. So we need to blend, even when we go online for some programs, we need to have a blended physical presence of our learners on campus. Uh, I believe that this will make education more accessible, but also improve our revenues. Now, face-to-face -face instruction will remain a major future of our education, no doubt about it, uh, but strengthening our ODEL uh, technologies is really the new normal uh, and it is going to be for a long time in our education system. One of the questions we have been asking ourselves and there have been so many discussions online is can online learning replace the physical classroom? Uh, many people doubt whether you can really uh, achieve as much as uh, online as you would in a physical classroom setting. We may not fully recreate the learning experience provided by the classroom setting for sure, because face-to-face -face interaction allows us to utilize even the para-linguistic elements of communication. Body language is important to learning, as well as uh, you know, social 
social interaction among learners is part of the learning process because we are, we are social animals, human beings are social animals. But face-to-face -face teaching and learning has been going on since the dawn of, of humanity. And certainly it is going to have a mainstay in our, uh, it has been a mainstay in our traditional education uh, since our traditional societies were created. And we know that even in, in ancient Greece, as far back as 387 BC, Plato's Academy were built on this first-first interaction model. However, since we are talking about ICT technology, let's remember that artificial intelligence and robotics has made it possible now to simulate any learning environment and even scientific experiments using augmented reality. You have heard in the medical field, for example, uh, doctors collaborating in, a, in an operation in a patient. One doctor is in the US, one is in Uganda, another one is in Canada, and they do an operation. How do they do it? They do it through these uh, new technologies, artificial intelligence. So it is possible to recreate a learning experience using modern robotics and artificial intelligence systems. So our challenge is to access these technologies and then use them for, for teaching and learning. What can we learn from UNISA? The University of South Africa is a leader in uh, e-learning in Africa. Uh, my recent search showed that they have about 400,000 students. 400,000 students. Can you believe that? Now, most of the students they have are really taught. I think actually all of them are taught through Odell. I know a colleague who did a PhD from UNISA and it had a blended uh, approach. She, she, she would go there for a few, a few months for first face -face instruction and come back and do the rest online. Adoption of Odell at UNISA, as you know, was a response to the post-World War II crisis, which affected many institutions. And so the vision bearer for this in UNISA was a man called Professor Andreas Jacob Sendrick van de Velt, who was UNISA's Senate member in 1946 and their first principal in 1953 to 55, and then later vice chancellor of UNISA from 55 to 56. This gentleman, when he was a member of Senate, decided to, uh, to pioneer uh, external studies as far back as 1946. And as you can expect, he faced a lot of internal resistance. Now at UC, we have just rolled out online learning this semester. And I can tell you many, there was a lot of uh, uh, discomfort and some resistance. How can we teach online? We've never done this. How can you, is this, is this possible? How do we achieve online learning when we're a Christian university? How do you infuse our values, our Christian values, which we, need, which we do by having students on campus when you're teaching online? These are all very important questions. But the, the point is not to say it's not possible, but rather to say, how can we go online and make this happen as well? How can we go online and also infuse the values that we cherish as Christian universities? BSU and UCU into the learning process, even when students are online. So our chaplains right now is, is uh, designing online uh, services and fellowship and other outreach programs to our students online who have started the Advent semester. Because we realize that we cannot sit and wait for the pandemic to end. Who knows when things will go back to normal? It may be another year of waiting. So do you then say, let's sit here and wait until COVID goes away and then we call back everybody to class? No, we have to adopt to the changing times just as Professor Van de Velt uh, realized that to save UNISA from going under at that time because of the post-World War crisis, they had to go uh, you know, the route of external studies. So when they started, they had what they called correspondence education. And this was basically posting lectures to the learners because many servicemen who returned wanted to learn, 
but they also wanted to have their jobs and earn. So they were saying, how can we learn while earning? How can we learn while earning? How can I have an education while keeping my job? Not every employer is going to give you leave for three years to be away, but can you learn while earning? And that was the gospel then at UNISA. So in 1947, they were already sending out postal lectures, even long before the, the internet uh, became uh, the mainstay of our systems. Now here we are, we have internet, we have all these social media sites, we have Zoom, we have Moodle, we have Canvas, and yet we are not teaching online. Uh, so that's a challenge to us. If UNISA did it with postal lectures in 1946, and 47, what about us with all these technologies around us? So let me conclude by suggesting the way forward. One, uh, let us continually deploy ICTs in our universities to improve service delivery to students, staff and partners, and also improve efficiency and transparency and cut operational costs. I must stress that point of cutting operational costs. Uh, Professor Maud, if you did a, a quick math of the costs you're incurring by doing paper-based meetings and uh, all these things that uh, make us operate in what has been called analog these days, you'll find that they cost you a lot of money, a lot of money as a university. And the same thing with UCU. Now, adopting ICTs is one way to cut operational costs but while we also improving efficiency. Uh, I have had the joy of, 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 of approving operations online through our alpha system and it's a very, it's an amazing system. Uh, things move faster, but you can also go back and review what you have approved and, and, and then monitor your expenditure. Secondly, with the cost for internet connectivity now becoming more affordable, as well as computers and smartphones, we have an opportunity to make our universities more relevant in the fourth industrial revolution. One thing we have done to enable our students to connect to the internet is to zero rate uh, all our e-learning sites. Zero rating means if someone has an, inter an MTN line, uh, which they're using to connect to the internet, they can access our e-learning platform without being charged anything. So zero rating is one way to make this happen. The other is to enable students and staff to own laptops and tablets through higher purchase schemes uh, in order to boost our uptake of ICTs and online learning in our universities. Um, there are many companies that we are talking to which can finance such a scheme so that the student then pays in installments throughout their study period um, but also this is an area where we need to partner with the government of Uganda uh, and we, we, we met the Speaker of Parliament the other day and we we're engaging about this matter, uh, saying how can government support us since going online has been one of the government's emphasis uh, in, the, in the recent period because of the COVID-19 pandemic, could government guarantee the acquisition of such gadgets on higher purchase basis? And then the staff and students can pay back over a, time, a period of time. So that would be one way of uh, increasing uptake of ICTs and online learning. Uh, fourthly, partnerships. You've talked about this uh, with the other speakers is uh, partnerships and public and private, uh, with the public and private sectors are very key, very, very key. I think uh, Professor Wallenia stressed this, this point very much. I won't uh, repeat it. But basically what I heard from him was saying, we can no longer go it alone as a university. You cannot uh, save money to build a teaching block, save money to build a hostel, save money to build a shopping center on campus. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of investment. But you can work with the private sector to get some of these things done. And many universities in the Western world, even in Africa here, have done it. I visited the University of Ghana and they already 
partnering with the private sector to put up halls of residence on campus on build, operate, and transfer basis. And finally, we need to utilize ICT and Odell to enable us scale up student enrollment of, of campus and improve our revenues so that we can cope with the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Another possible pandemic, universities which had a robust online teaching platform survived because they were still able to, to teach their students online, including by the way, primary schools and secondary schools. So suppose there was another ep ep epidemic two years down the road, God forbid, uh, would, would be totally crippled as private universities. So I thank you for inviting me and for sharing with you these ideas. I'm not saying that we have gotten there as UCU, but we have realized that this is the way to go and we must walk the journey towards making a successful campus that is driven by ICTs and Odell technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Aaron Mushengezi. And this has really been very great. You have given us inside and outside tips for a university that is partnering with you. And we are glad what you have said, some of them we are there. Now, in the interest of time, I am sorry members because we had to take some time, this is a presentation that we need to boost the Bishop's Wat University. Allow me to welcome Professor Phil Plad, the Provost of Trinity Western University, our special guest. He has been waiting. He has a PhD in psychology, Masters and Arts, at British Columbia, the Simon Fraser University. And he has been the chair of Globalization Task Force of Trinity Western University. He established four agreements signed in China uh, uh, of uh, Trinity Western University in Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei. Uh, he also he has been leading uh, uh, initiative of Trinity Western MBA offered in Tianjin, China. He has uh, also helped Bishop Stuart University. As we talk now, we have a first center. The first center has been supported and sponsored by Trinity Western University by Professor Phil Plad and, uh, and Dr. Imbezi George. We have almost every week we have meetings. Our program is at the National Council of Higher Education for Accreditation, but so far they have visited us and we had an interaction even online. So what Professor Aaron Mushenges you have said, we are there. Now Professor Rad here, is here to tell us as a champion of online teaching and blended learning from Canada to give us his experience. He was our guest of honor, uh, I think 2017. He was our guest of honor. He came all the way from Canada. He chatted a plane to be to, to, to our to Mbarara. What, what a wonderful experience. And the, the university is actually very rich. He will tell us, Phil Platt, you are most welcome. I know it is past midnight. We have taken off your hours. But thank you for sacrificing for BSU. Welcome, Professor Rad. Thank you. I, I hope you can hear me on the microphone. Um, we are you... hearing you properly. OK, very good. I'm going to go to my presentation in a second. Um, uh, I do want to um, thank you for your warm welcome uh, to Bishop Stewart University and to all of those who are on this Zoom conference call. Um, I have very fond memories of visiting uh, BSU back in 2017, uh, and actually um, Dr. Mbenzi George and I were planning a trip in June to go back to um, Uganda, but okay. um, with COVID-19, we were unable to make that trip. Uh, and so once the world gets back closer to normal, I'm looking forward to uh, visiting uh, BSU in the future and um, also uh, taking a look at the FAR Center that's developed. I haven't seen it yet uh, in person. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a bit of a futuristic view of, of education and I hope um, you're all going to be able to um, um, appreciate the context uh, of what I'm presenting. <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of context for myself. I travel around the world um, 
in a given year, I'll usually be in three or four continents, um, around 10 to 12 countries, meeting with different universities and government leaders and industry leaders. And over that time, I've probably visited close to 200 universities around the world. And so um, the comments that I have and the insights that I'm going to talk about today are really <coughs> um, stemming from that experience, as well as a lot of the reading I do in innovation in higher education. And I'm going to sort of look at higher education from about a 2030 to 2050 perspective of where we're going in higher education and some of the things I see coming down the pipeline. And I'll spend some time talking about the role and critical importance of university partnerships in the university of the future. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in this presentation, I'll hopefully have an opportunity to share with you some of my personal insights in terms of, of innovation. I function at Trinity Western University as the chief innovation officer for the university, vice president for innovation. And um, I've been um, tasked with the responsibility of finding new and creative ways of growing our university. Uh, and we've been quite successful. In some context, when COVID-19 hit in March, our university went through a strategic realignment process uh, very early on. Um, we were able to put our entire university online in three days, um, which is a remarkable feat. And the reason we were able to do that um, is because 15 years prior, back in around 2003, 2004, 2005, we implemented a technology enhanced education platform where all courses offered in the university were provided with a technology base of Moodle <coughs> and something called My Courses and My TWU. And those things integrated to provide students with a digital interface for all of their courses, even their face to face courses that are offered. And so the ability of our faculty to transition to an online environment when COVID 19 hit um, was quite remarkable and very rapid. Um, once we went online and announced that we were entirely online, we started to make decisions in the university very quickly. Um, and one of the decisions was to eliminate um, all of the travel abroad experiences, all of the um, um, experiential learning that we had planned for the summer months. And what we did uh, is we turned all of those things into online education. And what happened this past summer is our enrollment actually increased by 30% over the prior summer in going online. Even this fall, Trinity Western University is um, sort of beating all of the uh, local universities in Canada that we compare to. Our enrollment is up by another 6% um, really through the use of online technology and um, the ability for us to connect to learners around the world in terms of our international education. And so I'm gonna talk about how the partnerships we've developed have helped us to grow. And I'm gonna specifically talk about the partnership we have with Bishop Stewart University, because we're very grateful for your openness to um, partnering with Trinity Western University and the very hard work that you've done um, I know I see some of the documents I have to sign off on and, and, you know, look at some materials, but behind the very small amount of work I have to do, I know there are teams of people that have been processing documentation and information um, and working on a physical structure for the FAR Center. And we're very, very appreciative of all the work um, that Bishop Stewart has done and especially your leadership, um, Professor Maud uh, and... Um, um, Fred uh, Mogosevki, uh, our colleague who came to Canada and I met with him um, back in Canada. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and go into my presentation here. Uh, and I'm going to now um, go to the full screen and hopefully you're able to see this okay. If there are any problems, if someone can jump on the computer and let me know if we're having any challenges. I'm gonna talk first of all about why university partnerships are so critical for the future. And I'm gonna go quickly through the mega trends that are affecting worldwide education today. Um, and I'm gonna go over these quickly. And there are 
Um, six megatrends listed here, uh, and I'll go through them uh, and explain them. The first megatrend um, is technology. And technology has allowed us to flatten access of education. Uh, and what I find around the world today is that anyone with a cell phone and an internet connection can actually participate in and see what's happening in higher education. And one of the things I will encourage you in, in Africa to do um, is, you know, there's a concept in technology that we call leapfrogging. And leapfrogging is when you jump ahead of what others around the world have done in the use of technology. And as I've heard some of the presentations today, I've heard many people talking about computer labs and giving everyone laptop computers and putting computers accessible. And that's all great. But I believe the future of learning is going to be on mobile phones. And so we have to make sure we're building our learning management systems and our technology and our interaction with students to be mobile friendly, not just um, digital in terms of putting things online. So the first mega trend is technology and we've seen the rapid acceleration of the influence of technology through the COVID-19 pandemic. And for many people, you would say COVID-19 is the biggest challenge we've faced in our generation. And I will say to you what I truly believe that COVID-19 is the greatest opportunity we have in higher education to dramatically accelerate the way we look at education and the way we interact with learners. And so um, I think COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to rethink how we interface with the kinds of people that we're trying to serve uh, in our higher educational enterprise. A second megatrend is an aging world. Um, and you might not face this so much in, in Africa, uh, in, in Uganda, but we face it definitely in Canada. Educators and leaders today are slowly being replaced by the next generation of leaders who are digital natives. So the next generation coming after me, those who are in their 30s today, are the first generation of leaders who have grown up with technology, know how to use technology, and are very comfortable in the technological world. And so we have to be prepared to embrace um, the next generation of learners. The third mega trend is budget pressure and cost escalation. So cuts in public funding around the world in higher education are common. In, in, in addition to cuts in funding, there are internal pressures to maintain physical um, plants or physical infrastructure that is aging rapidly. So most buildings have about a 30 year life cycle before a significant investment needs to go into the building to keep it up. And many universities are facing the double sort of challenge of cuts in public funding and degraded physical plant or physical facilities without the kind of technological resources built into those physical facilities. And those things are very, very difficult for universities to manage in the current higher education landscape. And of course, partnerships and the use of technology help us to mitigate both of those kinds of challenges on the fiscal side of running our universities. The third, or sorry, the fourth trend, um, you can see up here, if you can see my cursor, is economic shifts and increasing dependence on emerging markets for growth and impact of universities. Um, research shows that there will be a, an increase of about 120 million university students worldwide by the year 2030. And that represents a 56% increase over the current number of university students around the world. And what we know is those university students are going to be coming from certain regions. So Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, India are key areas where there are lots of young people who will be looking for education and will need education in order to manage what I've got on later on in this slide, which is increasing automation and, and competition for jobs in the marketplace. And there will be a pressure for young men and women to enter into universities in order to ensure that they're competitive in the global marketplace. The fifth pressure is the demand in emerging economies and supply in developed countries. So developed countries have well-structured um, 
um, old and historic universities with lots of courses and faculty, but a flat or declining domestic student body and emerging economies have lots of potential students and not enough physical infrastructure to meet the needs of those students. And that creates an opportunity for partnership to meet and help both of those parts of the world to support each other and essentially to create win-win solutions uh, around the world. And the sixth mega trend is increasing automation and rapid urbanization. And we're seeing, um, if you, you look at population trends, you'll see rapid urbanization that continues around the world today. And there'll be an increased pressure for jobs and employment and the needs for lifelong learning in order for people to remain competitive. I'll give you a statistic. The statistic is, and this is maybe a statistic that is more um, normative in Canada than it might be in Uganda. But the statistic is that 65% of the children who are born today will work in jobs that do not yet exist in the marketplace. And that's how fast the world is changing. Um, areas like digital analytics, cybersecurity, um, areas like video conferencing technology, learning management. These are new um, industries that are developing worldwide right now, and they will continue to need um, um, employees. Uh, in them in order to maintain competitive uh, around the world. Oops. There we go. Key initiatives for universities to achieve the mission and vision between 2020 and 2030. And I'll, I'll go through these in turn. The first is a lot of universities have um, um, visions and they're very localized visions often and strategic plans. And I think as a, a, a chief innovation officer that universities need to become driven mm -hmm. by the big idea. The big idea that we as a worldwide network of institutions need to focus on meeting the needs of this growing worldwide demogra demographic of students. Are you presenting from your side? No, Phil, the slides yeah, are not- I wanted to present from our side so that people can see. Okay. Are you able to see the slides now on your side? Yes, we are able to see. Okay, that's fine. I'll tell you when I want them to go forward, okay? Yes, please, go okay. on. Okay, so I think universities need to be driven by a big idea and the big idea is, is creating affordable, accessible and flexible education for learners. Um, in order to do that, universities need to have in their strategic plan, the increased use of technology, leveraging blended and hybrid learning, online learning to make education accessible, flexible, and affordable for learners. Third, universities need to orient the higher education system to relevant flexible education with connections to career opportunities for students. They really need to be focused on helping learners find employable skills where they can go out and and serve in their local communities in a meaningful way. Universities need to, oh. Sorry, um, have credentialization of learning, unbundling of credit and accreditation, providing accessible structures, attaching credit to open learning structures like MOOCs. Um, today, there are 9,000 MOOCs, massively open online courses being delivered around the world by some of the top universities like Harvard and MIT. Um, and interestingly, in 2019, there were 14.65 million learners studying in these massively open online courses. And in 2020, just one year later, there are 32.7 million learners now studying in Merck, MOOCs which is an interesting trend. And most of those additional learners, 
that additional about 17 million learners came after COVID-19 hit in March. Finally, key initiatives are collaboration. Universities need to focus on consolidation. We don't need more universities. We need to consolidate universities in order to create high quality learning, collaborating in global partnerships and using innovative transnational models of education in order to create adaptive and innovative partnerships. And the far center concept and the structure of delivering leadership education between Trinity Western University and Bishop Stewart University in Canada and Africa in a seamless way is our attempt to move forward with this kind of 21st century collaboration uh, in the future. You can move to the next slide. So I'm going to talk, uh, get into the future. The future um, of strategic global higher education. And I would say it's a marathon, not a sprint. What I mean by that is there's no simple solutions to becoming a 21st century university that meets the needs of learners around the world. And I'm, I'm going to show you what I believe is coming over the next 20 to 30 years. And I'm talking today only about um, phases two and three of this sort of plan or marathon. The first phase for universities to be strategic global higher education institutions is the full integration of online learning in the university. Um, universities will have to create full online learning systems. And what Trinity has done would be, I, I believe a good recommendation for universities to train all faculty to use online learning systems and create parallel face-to-face -face and online learning classes where students and faculty can engage each other even in their face-to-face -face classes. And so we're using both simultaneously. Phase two is growth of partnerships, global multi-university networks, building beneficial networks to collaborate in research, education, and global impact through co-branding institutions. Phase three is developing pathway and progression agreements, developing agreements where universities can help students to move from one institution to another institution and meet the academic linguistic and, and, and localized sort of credentialing of each university. And Trinity Western University is involved in this in Africa, in India, uh, in China, and now in the United States with a few universities. And we continue to build out our network of universities in partnership. Over the past five years, we've established over 40 agreements with universities around the world to develop progression agreements and pathway agreements for students. And that's one of the main reasons why Trinity Western University was so successful coming out of COVID-19 is because we had a broad network that had been established over the preceding decade that was able to really support the university during this time of difficulty. Phase four is new degree innovation. Um, this has been mentioned in a few of the other presentations today. Universities don't move very fast and we need to help universities to develop new degrees that meet the needs of future learners and future um, industries in a more rapid way. Government bureaucracy, institutional bureaucracy like university senates really need to be streamlined in order to ensure that we can get degrees to market as quickly as possible. Phase five is RPL and competency-based education. Again, it's been mentioned already in the other presentations today. RPL is a recognition of prior learning. And then competency-based education is rather than focusing on educational inputs, who gets accepted, what courses they have to take, how do we break their course structures down? Competency-based education is focused on the outputs. Do we have graduates that have the kinds of competencies we need in order to perform certain skills? Phase six, and I believe this is coming um, in the next 20 years, is blockchain. Um, you've probably heard of blockchain in terms of financial markets, things like Bitcoin. Um, and some of you might be scared off with, by these things. But there's a movement right now in higher education to start to think about creating credit structures that leverage um, learning without having courses and classes. So 
the thing I've been really wrestling with myself is what would a courseless university look like? A university with no courses that created a blockchain of structures that could verify and authenticate learning for all learners as they go through the university and actually be able to give degrees. Um, now, I know that's way off in the future, but I think that's a trend that will start to emerge as we look forward to what's happening in global higher education. You can move to the next slide. Achieving vision and mission through university partnership is through the development of a connected global higher education network. So Trinity Western University is a global Christian university, and we aspire to be creative, adaptive, and network to meet the needs of learners where they are, leverage their God-given abilities, and equip them to serve God and people in the marketplaces of the world. We are right now all around the world, um, and we'll move on to the last slide. The last slide is about our FAR Center at um, Bishop Stewart University and um, using this center to bring students into a Canadian higher education system by leveraging technology, academic coaches, and facilitators locally and abroad. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Ladd. And uh, honestly, members and all of you who are listening, you will agree with me that we needed more time. And actually, we needed maybe a full day. This has been a seminar. But I'm very grateful, Professor Ladd, for your presentation. You're challenging us. 60, if 65 percent of the babies born today, jobs are not there, they are not yet there, then we must think it's no longer a stride, it's a marathon. That statement is eye-catching and it demands a lot from us. I'm now requesting the public that if you have something to say, there are questions that have been sent and I know our time is fast spent, never mind, next time, we are, we are on a learning phase, but I can say so far, things are great. I want to uh, recognize Jore Kavigumera at Chakashaka Gar. Thank you very much for attending. I want to recognize there are very many people who are attending through the YouTube and the, the Facebook social media uh, channels. They are there. Uh, the public relations officer is informing me. Uh, we are recognizing all of you, Habat Mugumia, thank you very much, Kwesiga, Kitiwa, Robina, Laura, uh, Ruro, University, Eva, you are all well recognized in your various capacities, and I'm requesting for just maybe a comment, if there is any, uh, I see some questions, I agree that they come on chat. Any? Maybe what I, I, the question that I've seen here, I have two questions. Uh, Professor Aaron Mshengezi, uh, people want to know from you, will online teaching reduce cost of education? Actually, even Professor Ladd, uh, people are reducing uh, their tuition. Will it reduce or it will increase? Uh, then there is also need transformation opportunities. They need integral thinking. How can this be done? Those are some of the questions, briefly. So do you want me to go first? Yes, go first. The answer is yes. In our universities, we of course need to invest in the technology. And I was very impressed to hear Professor Ladd's uh, uh, testimony that they were able to go online within three days of the COVID-19 pandemic. That was fantastic. Mm. But they did that because they had invested in the, in the right technologies to make, them, make that move. Now for a university that has not done so, of course you need to invest in the technology and that will cost money. But, Ultimately, once the infrastructure is there, then the, the costs that come with physical classroom education 
will, will, will go away. Uh, be, you know, once someone is on campus, they have to pay for the bed and the, and the electricity and the water that they are using and all these things in the medical services. There are so many costs that come with physical classroom education. And once you, you, you have people studying online, all those costs will go away and therefore education will be much lower. But secondly, online education is more flexible, is more flexible for the learner. Uh, whereas in a classroom, you have to be there to listen to the lecturer. In an online classroom, uh, material is often posted and you can access it anytime in a week or in a month. And so you can review content over time and it is easy to you know, pull out and come back to, to your studies later. So it's more flexible and learner friendly. So ultimately, yes, it is a cheaper way to study. And uh, we have many examples from universities that are running online courses and they prove okay. that. Thank you very much. Professor Ladd, what do you say from Canada perspective? Yeah, I'll give you a very <laughs> brief, I'll give you a brief um, story. We opened a new campus in another city, um, just close to our city five years ago. And three years after, after we opened the new campus, it was full, um, we filled it um, and uh, we built a new campus, opened it last January, just before COVID-19 hit. And that new campus that we've just built is also full, where I've done the analysis now, even though students are learning online, it's full. And we're not very interested in putting new buildings up and building new buildings. And so what the university and has tasked me with is to come up with a model where we could double the capacity of our campus existing structures without building more facilities. And the way we're going to do that is using hybrid learning. So students will study half the time in a class online and half the time in a face-to-face -face classroom. And that implementation allows us to double the size of our physical plant. And if we implement that on Trinity Western's campus, what it may allow us to do is to take poor buildings offline, demolish buildings that are poor that need lots of repair and invest in our higher quality buildings because we can double the number of students we can serve in those buildings by using a blended technology approach. So mm -hmm. online learning provides, as was mentioned, lots of flexibility if we can think creatively about how to use online technology to serve our needs as institutions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ladd. Professor Zati, I hope you are there. This is great. Betty, uh, there is a question here that the uh, learning and the curriculum for nursing and midwifery, I think maybe health, it needs attention. What is your view with reference to the nurses and now practical teaching versus ODER? One minute, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I mentioned in the presentation, not all diploma programs are, uh, uh, curriculum for diploma programs are developed by national curriculum development centers. Some institutions still have committees that develop their own program and nursing is one of them. And so uh, maybe they can just get support from a national curriculum development center. Uh, your second question was about e-learning. Yes. Uh, just, just say it again. It was how do we integrate e-learning? And actually another comment is on indigenous knowledge. How are you integrating it in secondary education? Um, e-learning e for secondary school or e-learning for universities? But e-learning for, for secondary school. For, of course it must start from secondary now transit to universities. Yes, I just want to say that in the last three years, NCDC has been digitizing the subjects. If you go to the web website, you actually find digital content uh, for, for learners. Of course, our challenge still remain accessibility of, of all that they have digitized. They've digitized mathematics. And also one thing that we need to begin to, to pick up is the Oh, we have lost you. Professor, is that you have lost you now in the interest of time? 
I'm requesting members that you give us just 10 it, minutes of your time. As issue of special needs, NCD. Yes, I, 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 can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. May you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I've, I'd actually finalized, but I think you didn't hear that last part. I was just saying that uh, as we go e-learning, we should ensure inclusivity. And here I'm also speaking to special needs learners. I think many times we forget about them. And yet secondary schools are bringing in lots of learners who are, have special needs because NCDC has ensured that they have digital content and they have braille materials for special learners, yeah. Okay, Professor Michelle has a hand up, but before he comes in, Professor Zati, thank you very much. Professor Barunya, there is a comment on, uh, you have made a very nice presentation about entrepreneurship. How about strategic plans that are shared? That someone is asking, how do you go about it? And also, uh, another thing is on the stakeholder involvement is another challenge. Someone has asked the Professor Barunya if you are there. Yeah, yes, I'm there. Um, yes, please. Well, it is good to make strategic plans, say three to five year plans, but every year it's important for you to review that plan and maybe okay. recast. Yeah. So, so you, you can recast that plan so that you are able to capture the changes that are taking place. For instance, right now, we are, we are looking at the impact of COVID and we think that we may have to reduce the numbers of students. We may have to invest in uh, more, more IT facilities so that we are able to, 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 to meet the current demands that we have. So you, you cannot shelve a strategic plan. Revise it uh, so that it, um, uh, it enables you to look ahead. Uh, the, the other question was, uh, sorry, the second question was what? Uh, but it was on stakeholder involvement. Oh, yes, yes. Stakeholders yes. are extremely important. One minute, please. Stakeholders are extremely important because they are the ones who are involved. They are the ones who are going to help you implement. They must be involved in what you're doing. Extremely yes. So, so you, you feel we, we, we must bring them on board at another stage? Or at what stage? I think that's when the you're issue. Doing, when, when you're doing your sort analysis, uh -huh. there are people you need to involve because the sort analysis, the external environment is analysis of factors beyond you. So it may be useful for you to engage them, to find out what they think about the, the, the university, about the business, about the programs, and they give you feedback on that. That's extremely important. Thank you very much. Professor Mwarimu Mushere, Musheshe, you are the one on floor with your question and from there I will hand over to Professor Kenneth Kagame, the Chair Council. Very much, you had muted me. There are two issues I wanted to throw to the presenters. One is, the, can you hear me? Maybe you become specific because of time. We can yeah. hear. Okay, thanks. The issue of uh, university and the research. I think we have to redefine research if we are talking about community engagement, community involvement, stakeholder involvement, because so far I think there is a lot of emphasis on the traditional research methodology of applied. There was a, an attempt to move to action planning now we are talking about participatory action planning. If that movement is done, I think you can involve as many instead of using stakeholders just as respondents. The second one is on the plan. Whether it is five years, I think uh, Professor Manunga has made it very clear. We, many, many times we are using the blueprint approach and therefore the plan is made asked for five years. And I'm glad that someone brought in the, the distinction between the review and the reform, which goes with the concept of flexibility. Uh, please, want... your time the question is hard. Let, them, let it be answered. Whom do you want to give you an answer? Well, someone who talked about research, I think it was the 
Professor Barun was? Uh, Professor Barunya, yes. Uh, even the Aaron, they all talked about it. Yeah, Professor Barunya, please. He called my chairman. Professor Barunya. Yes, uh, I think research, uh, this morning we had a very interesting research seminar. Uh, we're looking at crafting the research agenda mm. and we're asking what is the purpose of research? Research should be able to answer questions that are being raised in the country. If we are poor, how do you overcome poverty? If we, uh, if we are now looking at uh, teaching methods, how do we improve teaching? So research should be able to solve solutions, solve problems in the society. Right now, there's a lot of work going on with the master's students, which is unfocused. So it, it's, they finish it and put it on the, on the shelf. Yeah. So research should be able to solve problems of society. That is what, that's the role of the university. Okay. And uh, my appeal that all of us as universities should find, should get money from government for research. There is no, you cannot develop a nation without uh, research money. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hand over to Professor Kenneth Kagame, maybe has three minutes, and the, the Chancellor. Uh, in the interest of time, we are going to conclude. It's a very nice session, but we are very blessed to share with you. May you please share with us your presentations, and we are able to, 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 to read on our own, and other people, I'm sure, would ask us. Professor Kenneth Kagame. Wow. This has been a great moment, great morning. We have learned quite a lot. Join me. Join me to thank the presenters and those who tuned in and made contributions. Amen. Today has reminded me of a saying that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. But perhaps we should rephrase it and say a journey of a thousand miles begins with a plan. BSU is a young university, so we have a flexibility. It is timely that we review our old plans and refocus our direction. Where do we want to go? What do we want to be known for? How do we want to brand ourselves? How shall we reach there? Bishop Stuart University is not an island. It's not an ivory tower. We have an environment, we have the community, and it's all rapidly changing. Our strength and our survival will be in how we adapt to the change. We all know how COVID-19 caught us on the wrong foot. So we must be responsive to community needs. Our student needs, what does the young generation want? We have just been told that 65% of those who are born today, their careers don't exist. So we should all be on the lookout and be able to predict the future as much as we can. What do the parents want us to teach the students? What do the farmers want? What does the industry want, the employers? How is the economy? How are we responding to the economy? So on my own behalf as chair of the council, and on behalf of the colleagues on the council, we greatly appreciate the presenters who have enriched our process of strategic plan making. Special thanks go to Professor Philip Ladd and through you to Trinity Western University in Canada. This is true globalization. Professors Barunwa and Mushenjezi, we value the inter-university collaboration and partnerships. As we have been told, we need to create inter-university migration through a credit system that reciprocates. Professor Izati, I love it that you have questioned, rather you have raised the need for harmonized curricula where courses across the country have core competencies which we agree on. And when we have our, when we, our students graduate, then they are comparable. 
you have also raised the issue of teaching teachers that not all teachers because they have phds are good communicators so i will be raising it with the council on how teachers have to be taught how to teach ladies and gentlemen it has been a very enriching experience today you have enriched our process of uh, strategic plan making i wish to thank all of you and wish you best the rest of the morning thank you very much thank you the chancellor for the leadership and welcome the chancellor and today thank you the vice chancellor for coordinating this event we ask for more thank you very much I, yeah, you call the chancellor to talk you have now the floor to invite the chancellor to give his concluding remarks and pray for us our chancellor sir it's my honor and pleasure to invite you once again to talk to us and give us a blessing. Thank you very much. The Chancellor, are you online? Is our chance online? I may not be. Can we get therapy? He's huh? not online. Chancellor is not online. Since he's not online, the vice chancellor takes over. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> singular honor once again to appreciate all our presenters, our panelists, and our visitors, special guest, Professor Phil Platt, thank you for the collaboration. Professor Wasovarunya, thank you very much for the master's and PhD scholarships who are coming immediately Monday. Uh, next week, let's not miss a Monday. Professor Zati, thank you so, so much. We shall be inviting you for more seminars in the DSU. And Professor Aaron Mushenges, we are part of you. Thank you very much for the things you have discussed. Some of them we are there, but others we need to say we translate like e procurement, e meetings. We are, we are starting, but you are not yet there. And to all our viewers and listeners, and all who have participated, I want to say thank you and thank you. May God bless you. I want to request Professor Amini Reverend Mkundane to give us a word of prayer. I'm Just around, no. I'm around. <laughs> Chancellor, you are on. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. So you are the one. <laughs> yes. What happened actually is that sometimes I, my Wi-Fi is weak. So I get off and I get on my phone, which is more reliable. I keep switching. But I'm about oh. available. Let me take this opportunity also to very highly appreciate all of you who have participated in great presentations. I've attended several conferences. It's one of my best ever, I would say. And I've attended several even international. <laughs> so it's been great. Thank you, everybody. Professor Lloyd, that uh, linkage collaboration, we are so glad for it and the prospects and all that is coming. And also for Professor Valunua, thank you so much. I will also appreciate the offers. Professor Mshengezi, we've been in touch and we shall continue to be in touch. And you are an alumna of our university here. Don't forget that. Professor Zati, thank you. Dr. Biargaba, thank you. Professor Mauda, Professor Kagame, thank you. Let us pray. Dear loving Lord, we want to thank you so much for such a great presentation that we have had from different speakers, great ideas of the future and how we can position ourselves, but anchored in your word as a Christian university, where you will reign and be in charge. May you bless us, may you guide us. And we pray that action points will be taken from this meeting so that we shall see fruit in the future. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you, even in this difficult time of COVID, especially mindful of staff who have not even been paid, but Lord, they are enthusiastic to keep connected and get their students taught and we see how we start again 
May you bless us. Let everything work out for the glory of your name. Thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Amen. blessing of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all. Not be with BSU, be with all these institutions of ours who have been repre represented by their vice chancellors. May that blessing be upon our country. Enable us to overcome COVID. May that blessing never leave you all now and all. Amen. 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 And in the interest of public relations, they have requested me, all of you panelists, to unmute your, your videos and we take a picture. Uh, we want a photo this with one you. Is so quick, is she didn't hear. Eh? Vice Chancellor, you didn't hear my standard is low. <laughs> I yeah? didn't hear you. The standard is at the end. You could tend it oh, maybe we we'll take mm. a picture, a photo, and then we'll pretend it is a... Okay, you're welcome. Yes. And the last time people exit. You, 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 you shouldn't forget your identity. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. And mute, please, Professor Varunya, Professor uh, Mwarimu Musheshe, uh, Betty, you are there. May you unmute, please? I'm doing that, but... Dr. Imbezi, George, please unmute. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Professor Waswa, Barunya. I don't know why. Public questions. Dr. Mugabe, where are you? I hope public questions you have. I'm actually better now. We are going to sing. Dr. Timbezi, thank you very much for coordination. I, I think the, the host deliberately removed the, the facility for my picture. Oh. Yes. Sorry, so now, the, now they have taken the picture, so let us sing to Kutende as a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can start it. To Kutende is a Yesu, Yesu, Ori Mwana Bandika. Oh, Msai, oh, Msai, Kuna Sisa, Nevasa, Yesu, Muroko, Si. Thank you very much, it's done. Bye-bye. Thank you. We are coming to our panelists and all of you members. We are honored your presentations are needed once again. And uh, you will see us, uh, COVID affected us, but we can see we are now going to recover with all these presentations. And our chancellor, we pray for, your, for our mama to get healed. God bless you all and go safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.